Hey there, fellow. This is Miss History coming to you with another bizarre history tidbit. This time, we will be focusing on the shortest war ever recorded, the Anglo-Zanzibar War. The Anglo-Zanzibar War was a military confrontation on August 27, 1896, between the Sultanate of Zanzibar and the UK, fought for less than 40 minutes, thus making it the shortest war ever recorded. As per the 1886 treaty, the British Council was to issue permission for any individual to ascend to the position of the Sultanate. On August 25, 1896, the pro-British Sultan Hamid ben Tawini died, and Sultan Khalid ben Bargash ascended to the Sultanate position that the British hoped would have gone to the friendlier Hamid ben Mohammed. Khalid did not fulfill the requirements of the 1886 treaty, and Britain interpreted this as a provocation of war, consequentially issuing an ultimatum for Khalid and his forces to stand down. Khalid defied these orders and barricaded himself inside the palace. Hamid ben Thwini died in result of an assassination by his 29-year-old nephew, Khalid ben Bagrash. This was Khalid's second attempt to be a sultan, the previous being three years back. Just like the first time, British authorities warned Khalid who, this time around, did not heed the warning and installed 2,800 armed troops to protect him. The next day, each prepared for battle as Britain brought in more reinforcements while still negotiating with Khalid who refused, leading to the issue of an ultimatum that expired the next morning. By August 27th at 9 a.m., the British had gathered gunboats, cruisers, over 100 sailors and marines, and 900 local Zanzibaris were near the harbor, ready to face the 2,800 Zanzibarians defending the palace with guns pointed towards the British troops. At 9.02 a.m., an all-out war broke out with heavy British firepower that disabled those who were defending the palace. On the naval side, the British Royal Navy sank the Zanzibar Royal Yacht and two other smaller boats. By 9.40 a.m., pro-British fighters brought down the palace flag, ceased fire, and declared victory. There were at least 500 men and women pro-Sultanate casualties, and only one British sailor severely injured, who later recovered. Most of the casualties were as a result of the fire that burnt down the palace. German consulate offered Khalid and some 40 followers asylum, and later on transferred them to German East African territory on the mainland, Tanzania despite Britain requesting for their extradition for trial. The war also saw chaotic and opportunistic looting of property, especially from the Indian businesses, leading to the loss of a further 20 people. Britain brought in 150 Sikh troops from Mombasa to restore order, and many more sailors to put out the fire that had crossed from the palace to the nearby structures. Because the war damaged the palace, it was demolished and the space was used as a garden and the new palace was built. British protagonists got honors and several appointments in the military. Khalid supporters that were captured had to pay the costs of the shells fired at them and the costs of looting. Later on, during World War I's East African Campaign of 1916, British forces captured Khalid and exiled him to Seychelles. Although later on, they allowed him to return to Mombasa, where he lived until his death in 1927. Britain did not waste time replacing Khalid with the preferred Sultan Hamid, who became very loyal. However, Hamid headed the puppet government because Britain increased its influence in the government to an extent that Hamid became just a ceremonial head. Britain forced Hamid to abolish all forms of slavery, which led to tens of thousands being emancipated in 10 years. The Anglo-Zanzibar War was very effective for the British as no other Zanzibari rebelled against Britain for the remaining 67 years that Zanzibar was a British protectorate. On something that's pretty dang bizarre. It's the African lake that killed thousands of people and livestock overnight. On the 21st of August, 1986, one of the strangest and most mysterious natural disasters in history took place at Lake Neos, a lake formed atop of a volcanic crater in northwest Cameroon. Without any warning, the lake released hundreds of thousands of tons of toxic carbon dioxide. Estimates range from 300,000 to up to 1.6 million. And this silent death cloud spread out over the countryside nearly at 62 miles per hour, suffocating nearly 1,800 people and more than 3,500 livestock within just minutes. The effect was as devastating as it was swift. It killed locals and wildlife alike 
by starving the air of oxygen within 16 mile radius of the lake. Many people from the villages of Cha, Neos, and Sibum were silently asphyxiated in their sleep. Some were found with blood around their noses and mouths. When the few remaining survivors woke up, they found no disturbances, no violence, just corpses. Even the flies had dropped dead. Reporters in the area described it as looking like the aftermath of a neutron bomb. Joseph Nikwan, who woke up three hours after the cloud hit, recounted the experience to Plymouth University researcher Arnold H. Taylor. I could not speak. I became unconscious. I could not open my mouth because I smelled something terrible. I heard my daughter snoring in a terrible way very abnormal. When crossing to my daughter's bed, I collapsed and fell. My arms had some wounds. I didn't really know how I got those wounds. I wanted to speak. My breath could not come out. My daughter was already dead. It's one of the most gut-wrenching natural events in recorded history. The scientists still have no idea what triggered it. At the time, researchers determined that Lake Neos had released a massive amount of CO2 at around 9 p.m. And because CO2 is heavier than the surrounding air, it quickly sunk into the valleys below, blanketing everything in a sheet of toxic gas 50 meters thick. As David Brayson explains for Scientific American, volcanic gases emanating from the ground below the lake dissolve and become concentrated in its deepest waters, and the tropical temperatures form a sort of cap of warm water above this cooler water. It's not clear what broke the seal and allowed the deep contaminated water to rise, but it could have been an earthquake, landslide, or a volcanic eruption, or even something as simple as heavy runs muddling the water levels. The trigger was silent, but the effects were definitely catastrophic. In the absence of a scientific explanation, conspiracy theories reared their inevitable heads, with some locals convincing themselves that the eruption had been triggered by an undisclosed bomb test carried out by the Israeli and the Cameroon governments. But the timeline just didn't fit. Weirdly enough, a similar event happened nearby just two years earlier at Lake Manon, where a CO2 eruption killed 37 people. No one knows what triggered that eruption either. To help prevent these lakes from ever exploding again, in 2001, engineers installed pipes into both lakes. These pipes were to suck the CO2 from the lake beds and release it very gradually into the air. Another set of pipes were installed in 2011 after researchers warned of a gas burst that could be bigger than either of those disasters. With that problem solved, another one arose. The natural wall surrounding Lake Neo started to weaken, and the concern was that if something were to shift the earth around it, and dislodge it, there's no telling what would happen if the content spilled out. A dam has been built around the wall to protect it, and while researchers think it will hold into the near future, processes such as weathering or lake overflow can cause instant failure. Let's just hope scientists figure out a way to predict the lake's activities well in advance, so nothing like that ever happens again. In this video, we will look at the Great French Mustache Strike of 1907. Imagine it is April 1907. You are an American that just arrived in Paris, and you are searching for real culture. So you sit down in a little cafe. But before you can even look at the menu, a police officer approaches and very rudely asks you to leave. As he tells you, Zorty, he gestures at his mustached upper lip. You, clean-shaven, staggered off, confused and hungry. At the time, high-end waiters were on strike to demand better pay more time off, and the right to grow a mustache. The mustache had been virtually ubiquitous among Frenchmen for decades, though many waiters, domestic servants, and priests weren't allowed to have them. They were sentenced to forced shaving, as some would say. Indignant waiters, finally fed up, walked out of their fancy restaurants, along with roughly 25,000 francs a day in revenue. Some of the women were quite determined to starve with their children rather than see the whiskers of their husbands fall under the razor. Those who stayed were treated as those considered scabs often are. They were berated by strikers who wanted them to join the movement. The police responded to vocal agitators. According to a Los Angeles Times dispatch, the gendarmes were so heavy-handed in clearing out the strikers that they expelled every smooth-shaven man, including a dozen innocent Americans, 
who had just arrived in town, ignorant of the strike and who were bewildered by the hostile reception. Where the mustaches ranked underneath their demands likely varied from waiter to waiter, but the uprising captivated France, where the mustache had made the man for generations. The country had at last been forced to confront a classist injustice that had long been festering underneath its nose. The mustache was a symbol of masculinity. Most men desired the thickest of mustaches. So when the upper class decided to take away the privilege of having a mustache from the lower workers, it was like they were taking away their masculinity. The desire to regulate facial hair in France has its roots in the era of colonialist expansion and the Industrial Revolution. Less wealthy people had acquired more access to what had traditionally been luxury goods. So the elite turned to something money couldn't buy for a new means of projecting their status, even among the one percenters who had no claim to the masculine military image. The mustache bands were especially demoralizing for veterans, who had to abandon proud symbols of their service just to qualify for certain jobs. To be denied a mustache was to be demeaned or even emasculated in front of their families and friends. Contemporary news reports cited numbers ranging from hundreds to thousands and suggested that strikers joined and left the movement in waves. Some of the employer-employee disputes may have been resolved in their own ways. Some thought in order for the waiters to get a better pay, the Envision beer would go up in price. This would make the upper class pay more or even go on strike themselves. A small percent of the upper class were primarily concerned about the hygiene of their establishments. They didn't want their customers to worry about getting hair or anything else in their food. Eventually, waiters across the city had won the right to wear mustaches, some of them at the expense of their other demands. Perhaps the waiters got hoodwinked, or perhaps their strike was only partly about labor, and as much about belonging, self-definition, and identity. I'm Miss History signing off. So